in general when y uh, the target or the label is a quantity right because regression is going to try to, to produce a quantity but we, we talked about ways to get that quantity and make it into a more like a classification that uh, when you pick a threshold and then depending on the threshold goes you measure positive negatives errors ROC F1 so forth here we have logistic regression. We have the logistic function. What was it? Uh, 1 over E at minus E. We can add a parameter here if we want. So the logistic function, as we said, it's uh, going from minus infinity to plus infinity. And um, it's uh, from 0 to 1, right? kind of nice and round in here and it's very differentiable everywhere so this is not a sharp point this is a you know a nice round point clearly it's not convex right this this thing in here is convex it's kind of hold water the curvature is one way and after this point here the curvature changes the other way right uh, if I am to add a parameter uh, you guys don't have to do this right now, but it's useful if you think of logistic functions to know that. That parameter will control how sharp this, this whole thing is. So here's one that's more sharp. Right? This is almost like a step function. The more sharper it is, the more it looks like a stair. Right? Stair would be something that is straight up. So my sharp, I mean, in this point in here, it's almost vertical. And less sharp, the other way, would be a function that is, you know, kind of loose. It's still asymptoting to, to 0 and 1, but less sharp. So this is less sharp, and this is uh, more sharp. How can I have a parameter to control the sharpness? Yes. Multiply it and negative C by some constant. Right. Suppose I multiply this by, say, uh, some gamma. Gamma is a sharpness constant. 
what what kind of gamma will produce very sharp functions? High gammas, right? The higher the gamma is, the more sharp this is going to be. And the low gammas will produce flat logistic functions, right? So if we ever need to control how sharp this is, you'll see the logistic functions has other applications than the linear regression. And then it's useful to know when you think about this, if I add this hyperparameter gamma there, it controls how much of a stair do I like? Sometimes I really have a stair. That happens a lot. I have a stair function. But I want to differentiate it. I can't differentiate a stair function, right? It's too, it has those corners here, right? So how do I take a stair function and I kind of approximate it with a different function? I can ha have a logistic function that have a very sharp gamma, still differentiable, but really looks like a stair. I thought that's worth mentioning now that we're at it. And then in here, what is the regression function? Is g of wx. That would be, let's ignore the gamma for a moment. 1 plus 1 over e at minus the sum of the whole dimension of w And we said the objective in here, or the loss, we, we used the probabilistic objective. We said, uh, what was it? Is the log likelihood. And that was V over. So I take the log of the likelihood. The likelihood is a product, right? This is a product of probabilities of correct product over data, right? That we said, we say we take the, the probability of being correct for each data point, multiply over all the data points, that was the IID assumption, and then we take the log, because it's easier to work with logs. So what, what are we gonna get? Are we gonna get a, a log of the product for every data point of, um, what did we say is the probability of being correct? <coughs> yeah. This, right? So this we can interpret as a probability. Because in a logistic function, every value is between 0 and 1. So the logistic transformation is very popular to use it as a, as a transformation from scores into probabilities. Now, sometimes people talk, and I, I, I sometimes do too, about fake probabilities versus real probabilities. Real probabilities is actually how often something truly happens. Like what is the chance of raining, or what is the chance of shining tomorrow, something like that. Fake probabilities are mathematical models. You know, I'm estimating that that is the probability, but this is obviously not a natural probability. It's my mathematical model estimation of what might happen at some between zero and one percentage chance. So, but in, in nature, sometimes whether you have patients or weather or, or emails, probabilities may not follow a nice smooth model. In fact, almost never they follow such. We can't work with complicated models, so we approximate probabilities with simple models. That's why we call those fake probabilities. We would like the reality to match this exact logistic function, but often it does not. So in here we have probability of h of, what did we say, h of xi at yi. The idea being that when y, y is 1, this is the probability at 1, and 1 minus h of xi at 1 minus yi, was this correct? Right? That's what we said last time. This is another trick that's being used a lot in those models. Instead of saying for everybody who has y equal 1, that's the probability, and for everybody who has y equal 0, that's the probability, we can make a combined formula that says, OK, here's that, that's for everybody. And what, did, what happened when we did this? Um, We've got sum over i, yi, log of h of xi, 
Next step was to say, okay, we want to maximize this. And in here we want to minimize this. And how do we maximize or minimize functions? Well, we can uh, take the gradient, right? So in here, uh, if I take this delta j hat, delta wi, uh, I got what formula? here with respect to j. Didn't we do this last time? What did we get? This is more involved. It looks like you know I'm, I'm making it you know left versus right, but it's more involved because the differential has to be a compound differential in g, right? There's two functions here. G is the logistic function. And then there is a dot product, which is a linear function. So there's a function that says how you take two functions differentials, right, one on top of each other. Anybody knows that formula? So I'm talking about f of g of w differential, everything. How much is that? So when I have two functions, in general, I'm not talking about those functions in general, when I have two functions, they apply on top of each other, first g and then f in this case. Let's not call it g because that's the same g. Let's call it something else. Uh, l? That's another one. <laughs> or something else. Uh, s? Maybe? I have two functions, f and s, right? Not those in here. And I want to differentiate the compound, which is apply one function and apply the other function, and I take the differential. That, that's what's going to happen here. The inside function is the simple one, the linear product. And then the outside function is the g, which has some, I can differentiate g, sep g separately. I did this, uh, I think, last time, right? So what's the formula for the compound differential? It's a gentle. What? G of W. And then times? This is a DS. So it's like the first function differential applied to the S times the second function differential. This is something that most people did in, in high school in calculus, but if you if you need to recap it, you know, that's what we could, we effectively did last time when I kind of skipped some steps in the in the in the formula there. But what was the formula? Anybody can can look at the notes. What was the final formula? So what I've got here is uh, y times what? Y minus h of x equals h of x. So it is a like that. Same as this? Yeah. Maybe 
maybe a part of the sign. Yeah. I think we may have done something with the sign that's wrong here. Uh -huh. We are trying to maximize this and minimize that. Oh yeah. So one is a maximization, one is a minimization problem. But so some people get confused at this step. Uh, how come those gradients are the same, right? The the you look at the form is the same. Uh, that that's for now, like today. Let's say that's a coincidence. Okay, it's not. But that's the easy way to move forward. Why this happened? Just by chance. Okay. <laughs> because otherwise we get confused. Okay. These are different h functions. They're not the same h. One is g of the uh, the linear function. One is not g of. And the differentials are really different. If you look at derivation that's in the notes, we should pay attention to that, you know. Uh, I'm not gonna require a differential for an exam. You know, your exam is not gonna be differentiate the gradients. But it's extremely <coughs> useful thing to know how things happen, not necessarily to differentiate it yourself, but to follow a differentiation that may happen for a different loss. You should know how to do it step by step. So in here, if you follow the, the steps, you get Kind to the same gradient, which means the gradient descent rule will have the same form, right? Uh, that's another thing that we did last time. We said if you if you're looking to what was it, it was a parabola, I think. If you're looking to minimize a function, gradient descent says pick an x zero, right? We pick an x zero something here, and then how how did gradient descent work? takes a tangent, that, that is the function, that is the differential of the function, the tangent. And now the next point is who? x0 minus some, param, some coefficient here that indicates the magnitude of the change uh, times the differential of f of x0 at x. So what this is saying, move in the direction of the differential, the direction is here, this way. The, the move differential being positive, in this case, I'm gonna move to the left side. That's a, I, I think last time we had on the board an exact example of how this happened. And the, the nice thing about this is if I move, say, here, where I'm getting closer to the minimum, that's what I wanna get, the differential actually is gonna be smaller. And if I move on the other side by <coughs> accident, say I move in here, the differential in here would be negative. So if I apply this formula, so the, the same formula I would apply here, x0 minus 1, that is x1 add x0. And then I'm going to Every time I'm on this side, the, the, the gradient descent update would push me in the right, if that means I'm pushing on the left. And if I happen to be very close in here, say I get a point that's very close, what's gonna happen here? The, the actual differential is lower in magnitude because the closer I get to the minimum, the flatter the differential is, so the update's gonna start being very, very, very small. So there might be a problem here if I want to get exactly to the minimum. It might take a long, long time because in this area in here, all differentials would be so small, so close to zero, that those update rules would not move my points too much. So we did this. Uh, as a result, what would be my update rule in here? So gradient, descent, update. How do I update my coefficients? If this is the differential with respect to coefficient j, I have many coefficients, right? Many w's. Uh, I could say uh, j new, the new one, is two. The old one minus the, the strength of the, how much do I decide to move? Uh, h of x minus y xj.
Okay, needless to say, Homework 2 will require you guys to crank to these updates and implement logistic regression, right? Again, the derivation is not required. I think technically it should be not required for undergrads and required for master students. Uh, the reality is that if you want to be a data scientist, you're going to have to understand how these simple derivatives go. There may be some more complicated ones that are PhD level, so to speak, but at this level, you should be able to follow simple differential. So the last time we tried to draw that graph, we were trying to convert uh, labels, sorry, the quantities, uh, continuous values to labels, right? But how come now you're trying to use, now you're using it as a model, as a regression model? Right, so before, um, before that, right, we, we say, how do you use linear regression to do classification? We have a ranking, we have to pick a threshold. Everything about the threshold is predicted positive, everything below the threshold is predicted negative. Now we say, we want to not apply a discriminative, you know, like pass or fail, so to speak, right? It's equivalent of me saying, whoever gets lower than 70% fails the class, whoever gets more than 70% is, is good, right? It's a very binary decision that way, which the reality is that some, some points could be extremely close to that boundary, and by chance only they've got one side or the other. Now, this model here says, wait a minute, we want to treat things more like I'm not sure is it positive or negative. So when I, when I predict the patient has diabetes, I'm not just saying has diabetes, it has diabetes with a certain probability. So I'm allowing myself to say not black or white, but white, 80% chance, black, 20% chance. I mean, still a binary, just black and white. So the simplest model to do so is to take any scores, that's why it's from minus infinity to plus infinity, and transform it into, again, fake probability. Fake being because diabetes distribution of who has diabetes may not follow this logistic function based on a score. Right? Maybe it does, I'm just saying, this is a very simplistic model of probabilities world. It's like saying my score aligns somehow exactly with the distribution of diabetes in that population. That's one. But at the, apart from that issue, which I don't want to make a big deal out of right now, it allows me this sense of confidence, right? The other one, remember when we took the scores that you, what you guys did in homework one, took the scores and you threshold it, right? There was no confidence there. You either are above the threshold or below the threshold. That's it. In here, it's not like that. I know if I'm close to 0 0.5, right, or far away from 0 0.5. So if I get the score that's here, I'm going to get the probability that says uh, the probability of having diabetes is 60%. If I get a score here, I'm going to say the probability of having diabetes is 99%. I mean, that's the best explanation I can offer now. We're going to move more towards generative models and we understand this better. This is a big, big problem even today in data science. Uh, how to transform all kinds of scores. All models produce scores, even clustering, even unsupervised. Learning. Scores, scores, neural network produce scores, support vector machines produce scores. Every single algorithm uses internal scores. How do you take those scores and make probabilities that align with reality. This is a problem even today. My paper is about that topic, roughly speaking. Is if you have some scores, how can you tell your customer, hey, I'm gonna, if I say 60% or 70% you know, chance of having diabetes, I'm gonna roughly be correct about 70% of the time. So if you think of all the patients for which I said about 70%, if you look at all those patients together, roughly 70% of them have diabetes. That's an amazing thing to have if you are in production. Now think about you are a manager or a doctor or a, or a drug producer or an insurer company where you, know, you really wanna know a true probability or a probably a match reality about, you know, is this patient going to be readmitted in the hospital? By the way, that's a big deal for healthcare. When, when they release somebody from the hospital for whatever uh, problems they have, the immediate question from the insurance perspective, even from the hospital perspective is, can we expect this guy to come back soon or not? Obviously, if I broke my hand and they fix it and I go home, 
they don't expect me to come back. I mean, with a problem, they do like follow checkups. That's okay. But but they don't expect a broken hand at my age to come back back as a broken hand. But there are those recurrent diseases like I have a heart disease, right? Very likely, this person is going to be back. When? Is it, is it next week? Is it three months from now? Is it six months from now? And how bad is it going to be? Then? Because the way the insurance works, especially in the United States, uh, this is a big estimation problem for hospitals and for the entire healthcare system. Who's going to be sick and how many and how bad? It's not the same in, you know, say, communism countries where healthcare is managed by the government. That's a very different. Uh, uh, situation in there. But in here, everything is about money, so everybody's trying to figure out how money is going to work. It's unfortunate to say so, but I think you know, in, a, in this society, uh, mostly healthcare system cares more about money than about the patients, and uh, that's the way uh, it works. Uh, but because of this reason, probabilities are actually really uh, monetization of healthcare. There are other many examples where having a correct probability it, it's key to, to, to solve the problem. Now, again, this is a simple model. We're going to move after next week to something called generative models when we're going to see more complicated models of probabilities. But this is even today a big problem in machine learning. Now, let me go back to this. We have these things, and we have another thing going way back to like the first week. For this one, we said we can actually, instead of gradient descent is an iterative method, right? That's what it is. It's iterations. Iteration one, iteration two, iteration three. Up until when? Until convergence. Convergence in this case means what exactly? When is this process going to stop? When the change is very small, right? And presumably that's the point I'm looking for. A mental note for everybody uh, is that if my function doesn't look nice like this, suppose my function looks like this, the function that I'm trying to minimize, uh, gradient descent may end up in here, or may end up in here, or may end up in here, right? Any one of these points. What's going to be the most important factor to determine which one of those I'm ending uh, up in? The starting point. The starting point, right? If I start here, it's likely going to be this. If I start here, it's likely going to be that, so on and so forth. Assuming learning rates, this is called learning rate, right? Don't jump around like crazy. It's possible to start in here and the first update to move all the way to the other side, right? I mean, to have a crazy learning rate that just jumps around. But in principle, gradient descent doesn't do that. It just sticks to wherever you start, tries to minimize to the local optimum around there, right? You just start in here. So there is very little to do at this level with the math we know, as in high school, college math, and, and the machine <coughs> learning we know, to avoid this problem. This is a big gap. To get from here to say, no, no, wait a minute, I don't like this. I don't want to end up in a random minimum. I want the particular minimum. That's going to require complications. So we can't do this right now, but towards the end of the term, we're going to try to address this problem. So that's gradient descent. Now for this part here, way back to the, yes? What about doing multiple trials? Right. We can try. Uh, to start a unit, that's like a brute force solution, right? He's saying don't do it once. Do it, you know, do the gradient descent a hundred times for random, you know, points. And if you distribute those random points uniformly, presumably, but you have to have a range from where to where you're looking at. Uh, and you do it many, many times, you're going to find, in principle, all the minimums, and you can pick the one you want, right? I agree. That, that's a this absorption is not feasible because of the co complexity. Like the number of features and the possibility of a starting point. That it would be... In the number of features are not related to this problem. This is the objective, right? So it's not like it has more minimums because of the number of features. Yeah. No, no. Um, choosing a starting point will depend on the number of features, right? Um, 
the starting point here, so this is a unidimensional example, right? Yeah. In a multidimensional example, it's the W's. The number of points that we pick is not like if I have five features, I have, pick, I have to pick five starting points. Even in a five-dimensional space, if I have five features, I may have more than five minimums. It depends on the loss function. So we don't have to worry about this problem for the regression because the regression has a global minimum and because it's a convex function. So the, the property of how many minimums I have have to do with the loss that I'm trying to minimize. So what was the equation here? So this is the normal equation solution. That was, I think, W is x transpose x, x transpose 1, something like that. And we got this from a differential. Uh, I think we, we still use the gradient effectively, right? We use the vector gradient. This in here is not the vector gradient. This is the scalar gradient, the dimensional gradient for component J. Okay. And in here we use a vector gradient. Uh, let's see where I have that. So we wrote this as um, <coughs> xw minus 1 transpose xw minus 1. And then when we take the differential here, we got differential respect to w of that j. Got, uh, I'm going to skip a bunch of steps. I just want to keep the this differential here, we kind of, the first time we did it, we, we skipped the details, uh, and then I think after that we do it for real with trace operator. But the idea was here, this would be, um, if I just apply the mechanic from the unidimensional uh, functions, I get two how we've got to this normal equation. That's pretty much what we've done from the beginning of the term, except for the decision phase. So now we want to add three complications to the whole thing. One complication uh, is around the logistic regression. One complication has to do with controlling a little bit the W's. Like I said already, these formulations here have no control over W's. They will allow W's to be as big or as small as they want. And another complication is to interpret, to look at these linear forms like regressions and say, I want a different objective based more like on geometry. So we already have two objectives here. One is the distance. We picked that distance, remember, between the prediction and the y. Why we picked it is the easiest to work with mathematically. It allows me to have these nice algebra solutions. We pick another one that's a probability to say, well, if you take the score, map it to a logistic function, and interpret that as a probability of being correct, how do you maximize those probabilities? 
And now we're going to have another one in a moment that we're going to call a perceptron. But it's still regression with uh, just another object. So let me start with these complications. Uh, and then uh, let's see how far we get. What we can do now, we do on Tuesday. One complication is here. Mathematicians from the very, very beginning said gradient descent, not a good optimization technique. I mean, it does what it does, no, no question about it, it's just slow, and it's hard to find the right learning rate, and it's hard to manage the situation around there. So in practice machine learning, they have to, you, you, you're gonna see this, when you apply gradient descent, the, e the easy way to get your results is to try to adapt the learning rate try to figure out when to use a big learning rate and when to shrink the learning rate and not keep it constant, you know? And also define a reasonable stopping criteria. Like you cannot expect to be exactly in that point, right? You gotta, you gotta stop reasonably close enough, okay? So how else can we do this? So I, I, I want an optimization technique. Now I'm talking about pure mathematics. I have a function, and what this does, it finds a minimum, right? And this, this procedure, you can see why it drives towards the minimum, 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 and if I'm lucky to be in a global nice small function, I'm gonna get the minimum. Is there another way to do this? I mean, there are many, many ways, but anybody knows another way? Right, if I can solve the equations, I get the exact solution, but I'm talking about general optimization. This is called numerical methods because they don't have an exact closed form solution. It's a, like a trial and error thing, intelligent trial and error. It's not picking points at random, but still it's trial and error. That's numerical optimization. I'm trying a point, see what I am, okay, see what I can move, maybe try a little bit inside, see what happens, and intelligently I guide my search towards uh, you know, somewhere inside. If, if you are more familiar with computer science than calculus, I think binary search has that flavor, right? You, you don't know where you're looking for your value. You try something and you say, okay, that's too big. So where do I move? That way, right? As you look at the board, that way. If that's too small, I move the other way, right? How many people are familiar here with binary search? That's has this flavor of a numerical optimization. I can't tell with a closed form where the value is, but I can try out intelligently and find quite fast, right? Binary search is very effective. So here's a way to think about this problem. I'm gonna look at the differential. I'm gonna call it F prime. In Europe, most people call the differential F primes. In the United States, most people use this delta operator, but usually F prime is the differential of F. And I'm going to say, uh, let's find, we want the x that has the f prime of x equals 0. Let's call it root. Root for the, not the function itself, but the differential, right? Because uh, that's how we do it here. We're trying to find the minimum by finding where the differential is flat, right? The moment this doesn't update is because this quantity here is 0. So how can we do this? Uh, well, let's see. There I have a function, right? That's my f prime function. And I'm taking a guess here. Okay, that's my x zero now. I can measure what the function is. And remember, I'm trying to get the point on each is zero. So there's a difference between this and this. This is minimization of the function. This is saying, let's look directly at the differential, try to find the zero for the differential. The zero is right here, right? Right, that's what it is. Zero is wherever this intersects the, the line. But I don't know where that point is. I can, if somebody gives me a point, I can check the value, but I don't know where the zero is. I don't have the ability to solve a closed form equation like it here, to tell exactly that's the point. So if I look in here, I can compute this value. Like in here, I may be able to draw the tangent too. 
that's going to be who? If this is f prime, that's going to be f second, right? This is like the second differential. Perhaps to be easier for you guys to think in terms of this f prime as its own function g. And this works for a function g. It doesn't have to be the differential of some function. But for us, of course, we want to find the zero of the differential. And where should I go? Like, where should I, my next guess should be? Right, I have a point. I measure its value. I have the differential, right? And I'm saying, OK, guess where the zero is. Where? The what's left is what this guy is saying. The what's left. And he says, uh, choose your own step, so to speak. You have to pick this learning rate, which is a hyperparameter. This cannot be estimated from the same data that you use it on. Just move left, figure out how much to move. In here, what happens if I take this, this, uh, this, this, this uh, function here, and I say, can I tell where the f prime is going to intersect the axis? Not where the function intersects the axis, but where the, the tangent intersects the axis. I think I can calculate that. I think I can figure out where this intersects here. Now, if this is my point x1, this is very simple geometry because this, uh, this is the f in x0. It's, it's not the general second differential. It's just the tangent. So this is a straight line. Once I know this tangent, I know exactly where it's going to intersect. Uh, it's a simple ratio geometry here, right? Once I have this point, right? Let's assume this function was going this way somehow. I can do the same. I can say, well, uh, where is where is my value function? You know, I can I compute this is f prime of x1, right? I can also take the tangent here. This is who? This is f second of x1, right? It's this tangent in that point. Assuming I can calculate the second differential. But for most functions in, in machine learning, we can differentiate them two or three times, no problem. We, we avoid sharp edges. So I can, again, compute where this intersects. And I can say that's my x2. I can doing the same, right? Here's the thing. Here's the tangent. I'm choosing here. Here's x3, so on and so forth. You guys see how this is going? Just geometry is the part that you need to remember here. Uh, I had a hard time remembering the actual method and formulas, but the geometry seems easy enough, right? I still play with the derivative of a function, but I go not with the learning rate. I just go wherever the tangent intersects. It turns out this is a much faster method than the gradient descent to get close to the point that we want to get. So what is the update? The x new, the new point, is who? How do we say that with math? Derivation of the previous one? I don't remember. Let me see. How do we say that with math? What did you say? Well, how do we? It's x old, right? Has to go from where, you know? From x0, how did I get x1? I start from zero here and I subtracted. What is this area here? Right? What is this length? From x0 to x1, how far did I get? So can, can, can we, we have to know what the tangent really is, right? So how, x all, I'm going to say, let, let's, before we do this, let's do it for x, x1 was x0 minus this segment from x1 to x0, right? The size of that segment. But how, is this, how much is this segment from here to here in terms of the tangent? So x0 is here minus this piece. But how much is this piece? F dash of, uh, F dash of x0. F prime x0. F, F second. I think it's divided by. Yeah. 
So f prime of x zero is this this quantity. Is this segment. So now the tangent is what? That distance divided by f first x zero. So this works, right? No. Cartier root is f double dash of x naught at y equal to zero. What? So again, the, how much is the, ta the tangent is not, it, it's the, it, when we say the tangent geometrically, what do we mean? The slope. The slope. The slope. What's the slope? It's, is it this one divided by this one? Is that the slope? <laughs> I don't know. That's what I'm asking. So back to basics, right? <laughs> we have a function, and we take its tangent here. This is x, this is f of x, and the tangent is how much? The slope. Y by x. Y by x. Is this piece? F of x over x. Like that? So in here, how much is x0, x1? Is it this piece divided? So the tangent, can I say f prime of x0 is will be who? x y equal to 0. What? It will be f yeah. double prime at y equal to 0, not x 0. Yeah. No, no. The tangent is the, the, the differential in this point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so the value double. for that tangent at y equal to 0. y equal to 0. We want it on the x axis, right? Yeah, but what I'm trying to measure is how much is this distance here, right? I'm so that get it. So that will be uh, uh, f double dash at y equal to zero uh, minus x zero minus that value. I think what I need to have here at first x zero is uh, f prime of x zero divided by x one x zero. Yes. Because it's, it's this piece divided by this piece. That's the slope. It's not the actual segment. The tangent is not the length of the segment. It's how how tilted it is to the x-axis, right? Yeah. So a tangent of 1, a, a differential of 1, corresponds to what kind of angle here? 45 or 5 by 4, right? So that's when those two things are equal. So you guys believe me here? This is a faster method than that one. has a name. Newton's Since I'm at it, I would like to point out that we can get this in a different way. Uh, I won't insist on it at all, but I want to say, uh, here's a, one can, how can one derive this, this method differently? There is something called an approximation. approximation that approximates f of x with f of a and a, a expansion series. Anybody seen this before? So if I if I if I just keep the first two terms, so I, I don't I ignore this, but I keep this. I say I want to uh, 
uh, minimize as a function of uh, x f of a plus f prime of a x minus a plus one half f second of a x minus a squared. What kind of functions this is in x? So as a function of x, I took the Taylor expansion series and I removed the, all the terms except the first and the, sec the first second and third. And here, as a function of x, what is this looking like? This is a quadratic oh, equation yeah. in x, right? Yeah. So I can compute the x that minimizes this, this parabola. Because it's a quadratic equation, it's a parabola, right? That x is going to be exactly this one. So you can obtain the Newton formula by saying Taylor series expansion, ignore the, all the terms after the quadratic term. And now say you want the minimum f of x that's minimizing this part in here. So what's the minimum x that does that? It's going to be exactly this one. Try that. All right, so that's the first complication that I want to show you. Uh, is this more difficult than the gradient descent? Conceptually, I need something that I don't need in gradient descent, which is what? I need the second differential. But shouldn't be a problem for things like regression functions, right? The, 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 the second differential should be quite easy. In fact, it's very easy for regression. It's a, nice yeah. it's, it's a, it's a square, it's a square error, so I can immediately take the second differential. Uh, one of your extra credits, uh, which is, uh, I forgot if it's extra credit or graduate only is to re-implement the logistic regression, not to gradient descent, but to Newton's method. You don't have to worry about derivations. Just change the update formulas from the gradient descent to Newton's method, and you should see faster convergence rates. Second complication that I want to add. It's something that we're going to talk uh, at some point a lot more. As I said, uh, I don't like the W's unbounded. I don't like to let regression say you can produce any large W's you want. Uh, I have several reasons to do so. In principle, it's uh, the same problem like this inversion. While mathematically correct, the actual inverse matrix might be something that has very big values, very unstable. And it only has those big values because it overfits for some reason. Uh, in terms of philosophical Occam's razor, big coefficients are unlikely to explain or to justify what I'm going to see on my test sets or on validation sets. So I prefer to stick to the smaller. If somebody tell me for your data point the regression line is really funny, I have reason to be skeptical about that. So I want to say, let's do something to control the size of the W. Sum of the squares. 
to be uh, smaller than some constant. That's obviously going to control their size. It's going to say, uh, you can still play with those Ws. Regression can choose whatever coefficients it wants, except the sum of squares cannot beat something. So one big coefficient will, will imply a lot of others have to be small. And in general, so this is the typical regularization, but more general, uh, the constraint might be sum of wi at some power p, which is the norm p smaller than a constant. In general, when people say control the weights, they mean the second norm, p equal 2. But quite a lot of uh, regression models use p equal 1. And some others use both. We'll get there. Not right away, but we'll get there. Now, put it this way, uh, it's hard for me right now to do all the math. I'm going to do this math at support vector machines way later on, end of March. Because for this, we need a new sort of math. It's not enough to do differentials. For this to solve this kind of problems, constraint optimization, anybody knows what we need? Hmm? Lagrangian multiplier. So that's the sort of math I'm assuming some of you have not seen it high school. I'm not going to do it now. But I'm going to cheat. I'm going to say that's the, yeah, that's where we start. I'm going to start somewhere else, effectively skipping over this Lagrangian multipliers. So I'm going to say, here's what I want to do. I really want to minimize the following loss. Uh, let's call it adjusted. I'm going to say uh, J of W is what it was before, the sum of all data points of H of X minus Y squared, to which I'm going to add something. I'm going to add plus alpha times sum of W of D squared. So notice that this is saying you want to minimize this, but it's kind of a combination now. I want to minimize the, the error I get from the regressor. That's just the same like we did before. But I also want to minimize the sum of the squares. So I don't want one without the other. I could get a very small sum of squares, zero, right? By setting all w's to zero, if I want to. That's not going to do well here. I can get this to be minimized. This will be exactly this, right? If I, if I don't care about the, the second term there, I'm going to get this solution. That's what we did. But that's not going to play well. Some of the Ws might be very big. So when you talk about constraint optimization problems, you're going to end up with a mix like this. I have kind of two terms, and I'm minimizing a balance combination between them. So how much do they contribute? What's the contribution of the original regression versus the new term that we're going to call regularized? This is the regression loss. This is the regularization term. Regularization as in keeping these weights in check to not become that big. Uh, I can do it for general P in here. So that that's example here corresponds to this one, to the second norm. But if I have the P equal one or P equal three, I could have have here. What would be the what's the W norm for P equal one? What is norm one? Sum of values. Sum of absolute values. The absolute values. So I could use that. Now, these have different effects. If I say minimize the sum of squares of Ws, 
But how is that different than saying minimize the absolute values? The same as the difference for MSC that may be for linear regression, where it rewards being closer, or really punishes being far away. Right, so in here, one W big makes the whole thing big quickly. In here, one big W can easily be compensated by a few small Ws in terms of the absolute values, right? So this is a little bit more harsh in terms of no W can be big in here, and that actually increases with the exponent. If this two becomes a four, really no W can be big. In here, I'm still allowing some big Ws if a lot of other Ws are are small. Um, so now, the, the movement from here to here, that's the part where I'm cheating. I'm not ready to do this now. How do I get from this is what I want? You guys have to believe me today that if you want to do this, solve this problem, it comes down to minimizing a different loss, an adjusted loss. Now, I think if you guys don't believe me, you can just say, does this make sense as a regularization technique? Suppose I wouldn't tell you that I want this to be smaller than a constant. I would just totally hide that and say, hey, here's how we control the Ws. We minimize the old loss plus a function of the squares. Intuitively, does that, does that make sense that this, depending on the balance of those two terms, I'm not going to allow the Ws to become that big? Yes. I think it makes total sense. So, this could be said that way, directly starting from here. I'm going to add to the loss a condition of penalty. This alpha is regularization strength or importance. A big alpha will put more the minimization would become more about this, right? If alpha is very big, it's going to try very hard to drive the Ws close to zero. If alpha is very small, alpha is positive. So if alpha is, say, very small, 0 0.001, effectively this term won't matter too much, right? Even if the Ws are big, their importance the magnitude of Ws is not, is not really a penalty for this loss. So this is something I have to set up somehow differently. It's like that threshold that we talked about in the, in the ranking. This is not something I can learn directly. I have to kind of do trial and error. It's called a hyperparameter. So I'd have to try it and then figure out on a different set if I need a stronger alpha or a weaker alpha. Now, how do I do this? So I just change my loss from this into that. I can even further complicate things by saying, uh, not just that, I want to pass the whole thing to the logistic function. Right? I, I could say the same thing. I want small Ws for logistic function too. And then I have to add the regularization and do the logistic function. But for now, let's just deal with this. In here, uh, I have two methods, gradient descent and the normal equations. Can I do those methods now for the new loss, which is the old loss plus that term? Can I do the normal equations? What's going to happen? So I'm going to have that, right? It's going to be one half differential of what's in there, WT, X, T, X, W, minus 2, Y, T, W, T, X, T, Y, plus Y, T, Y. But it's more, right? Now I have an extra term. W. Is that is that gonna give me the W squares? Uh, with an alpha in it? Okay. 
okay? So the derivative is distributed over the sum, right? So I'm going to have the same thing like in there, x d x w minus x d y plus So I put here the identity matrix, but even without it, I think, again, applying the mechanic from the, uh, I'm missing the two here somewhere? Oh no, because the two, this in, in, in scalar terms is alpha w squared. So when I take the differential respect to w, I get two, two alpha w. w. Two cancels from the two in the front. So I get alpha. Identity matrix, you, we are done it in here, but I want it in here because I say I want this to be zero. It's still a differential that I want to grab into this zero. So now I can do the common factor of W. I say x transpose x plus alpha i W is x dy. So the only difference is from before is that I get this alpha i in here on the, on, the, on the diagonal matrix. So now if I apply the same thing like I did in the normal equation there, I get the new W is who? Who has to be inverted here? X e x plus alpha i, right? Minus one. That's the inverted one that I have to get rid of it from the left side. X transpose y. Normal equations work just as well. Uh, for p equal two, right? If p wouldn't be two, I'd be in trouble here. Right? Because to get this nice that differential out requires W squared inside, right? If this is not squared, it's 2.5 or 3 or 1, not going to be that nice to take it out. But the, the basic regularization, uh, it's W squared. Uh, that is, it's called L2 regularization. So this, when this is a square here, L2 regularization for P equal to an L1 regularization this is a L1 norm or L2 norm of the W is the conditional reporting so hands up who's with me so far at least in what I'm trying to do here value uh, W coefficients. Is it the cases where we have a lot of features and we have small training set? We have like few data, but we have lots of features. Uh, I don't think that necessarily results in big Ws. I think it could. I think the typical case when this happens is when uh, regression, it has to have more features than data points. Because you have to think of linear systems, right? If, if I have a lot of data points, versus the features. So take your spam-based data set. You have much more many data points than features, right? You have 4,000 data points and 50 features. That system is, is has enough data to be well-constrained, right? Uh, in terms of solving a system or linear equations, if I have the opposite, if I have 50 data points and 4,000 features, regression is gonna have a lot of freedom what to do with the coefficients. Right? Because I can sign, sign those, those 4,000 coefficients in many ways to get the result I want. But in your data set, it's always better to have more data than the features. So your point is, <coughs> if I have more features than data points, it's possible that out of all the possibilities that I get to minimize the loss, regression will choose some high doubles. I agree with that, it's possible, but it's not mandatory. This usually happens when regression has to deal with some outliers, right? If I have some really weird points that I cannot explain, uh, that's, that's the same as saying if this matrix is close to be singular, <coughs> singular meaning determinant equals zero, one of the eigenvalues is close to zero, 
not zero, because if it's exact zero, I can't take the inverse, but if it's close to zero, when I invert it, I get peak values in there. So if regression tries to map the line to match some, some points that are off multidimensionally, you, if you look at it in single, in single dimension, you see, wait a minute, even if I point, I have a point here, the regression line is well pinned in unidimensional, but in multidimensional spaces, this is not so simple, right? That hyperplane that's in there is not immediately pinned by the points that are around. So if I have a point that's an outlier and some other point that's an outlier and so on and so forth, the regression line might be, might be affected because of the square loss, they push the plane or the line quite far. And this point is here. So think about this is my regression line that will fit to the points. A point from far away will put, will can push quite far, even if it's one point, because the square loss, it can push the hyperplane in a weird direction. That's what I think you get the, the, the big Ws. Uh, it also may happen in sparsity. If, if a feature is only relevant for very, very few points that are typical for text, right? Because the, the points for which the feature is not relevant, take a word, I, I did this example before, the word virtue only appears in one document out of a <coughs> The, the, the regression can put any coefficient it wants on that term because most of documents don't affect the loss. They don't have the word Virgil. Their feature value is zero. So they won't affect the square loss. Only <coughs> one document gets to affect the square loss. So even if the W is big, it's not resulting in a big loss. So sparsity may also create high coefficients. In fact, all regressions for text are L2 regularized by default for this reason. We don't want arbitrary large coefficients. There's also computational problems with this. If I allow big, big numbers, I'm starting having computational problems. There's other reasons for these ones, the reasons that have to do with computation and statistics. If you are familiar with linear algebra, increasing the diagonal, this is a covariance matrix. We're going to do that later, but that's what it is. We're going we're gonna to discover that if you measure variances and covariances between the, the features, this is the matrix that's empirical covariance. In their statistics, quite, quite often, we increase the diagonal. So we look at the matrix, and we say, take the main diagonal of the matrix and increase the value on it. You know the secondary diagonal? Right. Well, it depends how you draw the matrix. <coughs> so this in here, alpha, because it's, who is I? I is 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, right? If I increase the main diagonal, it has a, a natural effect on both the covariance matrix, but also on the eigenvalues of this matrix, right? I move the eigenvalues away from 0. something that feels reasonable. You should try this very simple exercise. Put a random matrix to MATLAB. MATLAB is going to give you the eigenvalues. It has a function that just gives you the eigenvalues. And now add on the diagonal, add a 10 on every lambda alpha equal 10 times identity matrix, add a 10 to every element on the diagonal. And recompute the eigenvalues. You're going to see higher eigenvalues. Higher eigenvalues means the determinant is farther from zero. The determinant farther from zero means the inverse doesn't have big values in it, right? Because the determinant of the inverse is the one over the determinant of the matrix. The more I increase that determinant, I'm preventing the inverse to be unstable. So there are three notions that are all correlated here. The statistical notion that if you measure variances and covariances, What's on the diagonal of a covariance matrix? Those are the actual variances. These are the sigma i i. That's the variance of sigma 1 1, sigma 2 2, sigma 3 3, and so on and so forth. On this diagonal, there will be the variances of each feature. In every i j, that's the covariance between feature i and feature j. Nobody's seen a covariance? Everybody's standing here. 
Nobody has seen a covariance, empirical covariance matrix before. A matrix of correlations, okay. Co covariance, fancy term, let's skip it. Correlation between features, right? How linearly correlated is feature one or feature two? That would be uh, sigma one, two. How linearly correlated that? If my features are completely independent, how is this matrix gonna look like? Uh, Variance of each feature and zero on the rest. By increasing the diagonal, I'm making the variance of each feature much more dominant than the covariance between the features. So I'm making this more independent. By adding values on the main diagonal of the covariance matrix, I'm making the data more independent. Because the covariances will appear a lot smaller than the diagonal, which is the variance. That's aspect number one. Aspect number two is what I've done here. This, as a Lagrangian, as a derivation, corresponds to adding a penalty constraining the Ws to not be big by the L2 norm. And number three is that in a linear algebra sense, if I increase the diagonal, I increase the eigenvalues, which prevents this matrix to go crazy, the inverse. So L2 has been known for a long, long time. Mathematicians knew about the L2 techniques. Take a matrix that increases diagonal for all kinds of purposes, either statistics or linear algebra or inversions, so on and so forth, before machine learning existed. So this is well known from 1950s when nobody knew what machine learning is, L2. Other regularization techniques have been developed by the machine learning because we run into all kinds of problems and we debug the data, the algorithms, we say, wait a minute, we don't want that to happen. How do we enforce my loss of my algorithm to avoid that part? But this is known since long time ago, L2 regularization. So because it's uh, easy, you guys can implement it this way quite easily. Whatever you take the pseudo inverse in there, it's no big deal to add some alpha plus something on the diagonal, right? There's no problem. Um, can I do the gradient descent? So if I say, OK, that's what I want to do, but uh, I want to do a gradient descent, how would that look like? So I'm having this. What is now this, this differential? I do the same differential of the loss with respect to a particular component J. That's what I did to take the gradients, right? How this look like? Is it the same gradient as before? The, the first part remains the same gradient as before, so how much was it? This? Was it? Wx minus y xj, and how much is going to be that? Something like that? So now the update rule is? the whole vector here. This is the old one, right? Um, the two, I think, goes away with the, there's another two in there, right? So if this is a half, the differential would be without it. Again, if you implement the gradient descent, no big deal to change your rule to add. This will take five minutes to change your code, right? And we care about the effect. So when you come to, to this, I think this is one of the problems that asks for this variant. Uh, we need to compare the at the end when this whole thing converges. The critical part is how performance is different. So presumably, on the training set, this is better. You're going to get a better performance with W's unconstrained. 
But on a test set, you might get the same performance, even though those are not the optimum doubles for the for the training set. They actually might not be so bad when you do the test. And we want to show that they are smaller, like the average W in terms of the absolute size. It's smaller than what you can get in there. Uh, I'm not sure that's going to happen on the on the, on the spam-based data set, but. That's what the constraint is meant to do. So the easy thing to do is the L2 norm in here. L1 norm for other regularizations would be far more tricky to do. And even for this, again, we skip the philosophical, mathematical part. How do we take from a, from a constraint optimization problem here to there? So for now, we just assume, hey, Here's how we penalize big Ws. We add something to the loss. But there is a way to get from here to there. So that's the second thing that I want to say about regression. So, so far, we have a better optimization technique. That's this Newton method, as opposed to the gradient descent. And we also have a way to regularize to say, if in practice, we don't want big Ws. Here's how you can achieve that. And we're lucky for at least linear regression. This can be done with normal equations, can be done gradient descent. Can we do it for the logistic regression? Can I be done? So I want the same. I want to minimize the logistic regression, but somehow not allow big Ws. So how would I do this? So the loss, the difference between this and the linear regression is that in here the loss is not this uh, discriminative uh, loss function. This, the, the shape of it, plays somehow well with my regularization term, right? It says, you know, if this and this seem to be plausible quantities to put together, but this loss here is not. Yes? When you're maximizing the likelihood, could you add a term that's like the probability that W is some large value? It's a, oh, as a penalty. Or as a, yeah. yeah. So I have to figure out a way to do that, right? I mean, I mean, it's, I don't know an obvious way to put this constraint, big W, on a probabilistic loss. This is a, this log is nothing. It's a probability of being correct, right? So it's a bunch of probabilities in there that are made a product. And I still want the same effect. I want to say I want to do that, but not big Ws. And if I manage to get such a loss, I'll have to do some derivations here. I'll have a new gradient. I have no hope with normal equations here. Like I said before, this whole loss in here with probabilities will not result in a closed form solution. But at least the gradient descent version, if I could do the gradient and then do the update rule, presumably I'm going to get a logistic regression to regularize coefficients. So we're not going to do this today. You can figure out what, what you, and here's an exercise for Tuesday. Let's see who comes up with an idea of how to do that. Because the problem is equally valid with logistic regression, right? I, I don't want big coefficients. Big coefficients means unstable and means overfitting. So they bet mathematically, bet computationally, bet for prediction tests. But I have a problem of how to put that condition in this loss here. The other thing that I want to show you today is something that's going to be part of the homework very soon. A different kind of regression. I mean, it's still a line. But the loss is now different. It's 
the loss of perceptron. Funny name. So I want the same thing, a bunch of coefficients that the line uh, or the hyperplane fits my data. But here's what I, I meant. I'm going to draw the, say, suppose I have three dimensions. This is my data. Um, so say I have x1, x2, and x3, the dimensions. And in here are all my data points, right? A particular uh, point. at the axis. And here's a point that happens to be uh, you know, x1, it's x11, x12, and x13. And this is a plus. And then I have uh, another point here that is uh, also a plus. And I have another point here that's a plus. I represent every point as a vector here. And I may have a point in this side that's a minus, and this is a minus, and this is a minus. Obviously, in terms of a separation, my hyperplane, this is the h of x. Uh, separates pluses to minuses. So I want to put a simple loss that says, you know what? Can you drive a hyperplane that leaves the minuses on one side and pluses on the other side? That's it. That's equivalent of picking that threshold, right? That says, pick the threshold with the condition that everything is positive, it's above the threshold, everything is negative below the threshold. It doesn't have that, that distance sense that quadratic loss has, or the problem loss has. It doesn't say you are that far away or that far over. It just say you are either over, you are correct, or you are under, and you are correct, or under and incorrect. There are four cases, right? like we did confusion matrix. Predicted positive, that's positive. Predicted positive, that's negative. Predicted negative, that's positive. So in here, it's a zero, one bank. You're either black or white. So this, what this does is saying, uh, first of all, I'm going to move just for, for mathematical manipulations. So I want the loss that saying uh, separate plus versus minus completely, like all of them. Is it possible to drive a hyperplane that separates all pluses or minuses? Like we've already seen, many data points are not linearly separable. Remember that example of the circle? There's no way to draw a circle there. But let's assume they are. How do we find such a hyperplane that separates them? So step one, this is manipulation. Uh, if x, if y is negative, is y is minus, like this point, they have negative labels, uh, transform this point into minus x and minus y, which is now plus. So in other words, instead of considering this vector on the negative side, I'm going to reverse it, I'll take one of those, this one, and say, OK, this one becomes a plus on the other side. because. For a hyperplane to put this on the minus side, it's equivalent to put the symmetric one on the plus side, right? Every hyperplane that has these vectors on the negative side will have the symmetric one on the positive side. So by saying I want those minuses to be on the minus side, it's saying I want the minus, the symmetric, this is the origin point, the symmetric is in here, right? This is an x, and with the y is negative. The symmetric version is who? minus x with the y being positive. Hands up. This is a simple geometry, OK? It's just saying hyperplane doesn't measure any distance or probability. It just says it has to have minus correct side plus correct side. And what it does says, OK, the pluses have to be on the plus side. And every minus, instead of asking for the minus to be on the negative side, ask for the minus the point to be on the positive side. So I can delete this one here now. Because in my, I literally modify my data point. This email, I reverse all the 
I multiply minus one with all the feature values, and I change the label from zero to one. Literally, I look in my data set, what's the email that has a label zero? Multiply with the minus one all the feature values and change the label from zero to one. Make sense? And then I can do the same with this, okay, reverse this in here, delete it, and reverse this in here. So now, what am I saying? I want the hyperplane after this reversion. By the way, the, 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 the symmetry does have nothing to do with the hyperplane, right? Reverting those, those points is simply look at the data points with y equal minus or zero, multiply them with minus one, and change the label to one. So I can do that in advance before I run anything. So this is step one. For everybody who has the y negative, change it, the data point, to a y positive, and the feature values are reduced. Now, what's the condition of this hyperplane? When a hyperplane is good, I don't have negative points anymore. All data has to be on the plus side. Right? So the condition becomes all data on plus side of the hyperplane. Hyperplane uh, which is y, y, x. So the loss I'm gonna use for that is only penalizing the points that are on the wrong side. So what this is saying is um, <coughs> if minus x w, so if, step, if, if x w is all the y with the condition x y w is negative, I'm only gonna look at the ones that if we draw a hyperplane and I see a point here, that's no good. Because now all points have to be on one side. I'm not penalizing the plus side at all. I'm saying those are already good where they are. But for the ones that the plane puts them on the negative side, that is x j x i times w is negative, I'm going to say that's wrong. How wrong it is, how, however wrong it goes to the negative side. So I'm going to stop here, but I want to nail this point down. I have a different kind of loss. I'm still looking for a linear separation. That's a regressor. It's the same function as before. But my loss is different now. My loss is based on geometry here. It's saying, if you put all the points on the correct side, you're good. Loss is going to be zero, right? If no point is negative, how much is going to be this one? Zero. Because this only is measured for the points on the wrong side. This in here is the wrong it doesn't measure anything about the, the correct side. For every point that's the wrong side, it says how far how far you went in the wrong side. And it kind of adds that up. All these quantities are positive, right? Because if this xw is negative, minus that is positive. And it might be three or four points that are on the positive side. Those three or four points will dictate the loss. This is the perceptual loss. And if the loss is zero means all points are on the correct side. If the loss is positive means I have some points on the wrong side. If I have a point here on the wrong side, what am I supposed to do with the plane? Shift it a little bit to put that point on the correct side. As soon as the plane shifts to this point is in the positive side, the loss will become zero. So the question is, how do we shift this plane so that all points are on the positive side, if that's possible? I'm assuming the data is linearly separable, which means all points can be on the right side. And once we define the loss, you'll see that it's no big different than before. We can do this with gradient descent by taking the differential, update rule, and so on and so forth. But we'll, we'll, we'll see that next time. So the perceptron loss itself is not a useful algorithm. I'm running a perceptron. You have to run it for homework too, but that's just for pedagogical purposes. This is going to help us define bigger structures.
than the first strong themselves. So I want, I'm going to give a cookie for whoever figures out how to add a penalty for logistic regression here. How do I add a penalty for this loss? Okay, that's, that's in the air. We, we didn't solve that. I'll be at office hours today if you, if you see me. And the homework is going to be due in about nine days, I think. This homework. Oh, okay.